Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you once again to all of you for joining us for this daily uh, briefing. I want to start, as I always do, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to the spread of COVID-19 in Scotland. Um, as at nine o'clock this morning, I can report that there have been 8,450 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 263 since yesterday. A total of 1,809 patients are currently in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, which is an increase of 12 from yesterday. And a total of 169 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is a decrease of five on yesterday's figures. However, in the last 24 hours, I'm afraid that 12 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test of having uh, COVID-19. And that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 915. Once again, I want to express some caution about that figure. Although people can now register deaths over the weekend, we would still expect that the number of registrations on Saturdays and Sundays uh, to be relatively low. Uh, so we should take that into account when considering the figure I have just given you. And of course, it continues to be absolutely essential that we never ever lose sight of the human reality behind these statistics. Each death represents a loved individual whose loss is a source of grief to their family and friends. Uh, and so yet again, I want to extend our deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. I also want to express our thanks, as I always do, to all of our health and care workers right across the country. You are doing extraordinary work in the most difficult of circumstances and our gratitude continues to be with you each and every day. I've got two issues I want to briefly update on today. Uh, the first is the help we're making available to people who are right now struggling to access food, either because you can't leave the house or have no family or immediate support or because you might be facing financial difficulties. And the main message I want to convey today is an important one, but a simple one. Help is available. So please ask for support if you need it. I'm going to, in a few moments, read out a national helpline number uh, for those of you who might need to access that. The Scottish Government has more than doubled our investment in grants through the Scottish Welfare Fund from £35 million to £80 million so that councils can provide grants to people on low incomes who need immediate help. And these grants provide people with funds directly so that they can buy food and other goods that they need. We're also putting in place specific programmes and I want to go through some of the different arrangements in place for different people. If you are one of the approximately 150,000 people who are in what we call the shielded group, the most vulnerable group who are being told to isolate completely, then our text message shielding service or your local authority helpline or our national helpline can help you to order free weekly deliveries of basic food and essential supplies. Information is also available on the NHS Inform website. So far, more than 41,000 packages of food have been delivered and people who have signed up in the last week, while they may not yet have had their first delivery, uh, will do so shortly. Uh, the National Helpline I've just mentioned, and I'll give this number in a, a couple of moments, is also there for those who might not be in the shielded group, but potentially at risk in some other way. For example, people over the age of 70, people with disabilities, pregnant women, people who get the annual flu jab and people who need support from mental health services. The helpline, when you phone it, directs you to your local authority and therefore it's also a good way of finding out what assistance is available in your own area and what support might best meet your circumstances. Uh, that might be a community care grant uh, or it might be food being directly supplied and delivered to you. So the number of that helpline, which I've given at a previous briefing but want to emphasise again today, is 0800 111 4000. That helpline is available between 9am and 5pm every weekday. It's a free line and since it has been launched, it's been already used by thousands of people. And now, of course, due to the volume of calls, uh, at some times you might find yourself placed in a queue but please be patient and hang on because we will get to you. 
We're also providing additional funding for local authorities to make sure free school meals remain available. Around 140,000 children across Scotland are currently being provided with free school meals, either within council and early years premises which are still open or through direct cash payments, supermarket vouchers or food being supplied to them. Uh, and finally, we are working with community and third sector organisations. Uh, this morning, for example, we've announced £350,000 of extra funding for the Wheatley Group to provide 8,500 uh, food deliveries in 17 different local authority areas. Each delivery will supply food to people uh, in need uh, that will do them for seven days. And a further 18 schemes will share £400,000 to provide emergency food. Uh, these schemes will work with minority ethnic households, family support groups and mental health teams. In all of this, it's important to say that we're working closely with key partner organisations such as local authorities, Fair Share, the Trussell Trust and the Independent Food Aid Network to make sure that what we are offering to people in this time of need is as coordinated as possible. Now, I realise that there's a lot of detail uh, here that I've given, but the key point I ask you to remember is this straightforward one. If you can access food for whatever reason, that might be because you are shielding, you might be self-isolating, or you might find yourself right now unable to afford food for your family. Please contact your local authority directly or phone the National Helpline. And I'll give that number again, 0800 111 4000. Nobody should have to worry about access to food. So if you need help, uh, please ask for that help and we will make sure that you get it. Second issue I want to briefly update on relates to education. Of course, for most children and young people, uh, this week, today, in fact, would uh, start the mark the start of the summer term. I said before that the decision we took to close schools to suppress the spread of this virus uh, and to keep them closed is one of the hardest uh, I've ever had to take as First Minister because I know how disruptive that is to the lives and education of our young people. And I want to again thank children and young people for putting up with this disruption so well. I also want to say a special thank you to parents and carers across the country. I know that many of you are juggling looking after your children with work and other caring responsibilities. And of course, with the worries and anxieties that all of us have about this pandemic. I know how difficult that is. So thank you for doing the right thing for keeping your children at home and looking after them there. The Scottish Government uh, today has published some guidance to support continuity in learning while our schools remain closed. This guidance builds on the work that has already been done by teachers and many others, and it focuses on three main areas. It covers support for children and young people as they learn at home, including particular support for those who need it most, for example, people with additional support needs. It also covers support for parents and carers as you help children, and also support for teachers and school leaders. We're very aware that this current situation is likely to have the biggest impact on the most disadvantaged children and young people in our society. So we've already provided local authorities with the flexibility they need to redirect the resources we give them aimed at closing the attainment gap to help mitigate the impact of school closures on our most disadvantaged families. And I think it's worth stressing at this stage that nobody's expecting children, parents and carers to recreate classrooms while schools are closed. We don't think that's either possible or desirable, but we do want to protect children's welfare while enabling them to continue to learn. And today's guidance sets out some further ways in which we are doing that. And if you're a parent or a carer watching this, I hope you will find that helpful. Now, I'm about to hand over firstly to the Chief Medical Officer and then to the Chief Nursing Officer. But before I do that, let me again say how tough I know all of this is. But again, let me stress that everything we are doing right now, everything I'm asking you to do and everything you are doing is essential. Towards the end of this week, I will set out some of the factors that will guide our thinking for the future. I want to be clear, however, that the initial version of this work will not set out what measures will be lifted and when. We're simply not yet in a position to take those decisions in a properly informed way. And I will not rush to do anything that could risk a resurgence of this virus, because to do that would risk overwhelming the National Health Service and it would put many more lives at risk. 
But what we will start to do is set out, firstly, our objective, which is continuing to suppress the virus while considering how we can even gradually restore a semblance of normality to everyday life. Uh, we will set out the factors that we need to consider as we do that and the framework in which we will seek to take these decisions. But it will also be clear, the work we set out later in the week, that living with this virus, as we will need to learn to do, is likely to mean some restrictions on everyday life in the form of social distancing for a while to come. But as we consider the best way forward and the very difficult decisions that that will entail, we will be as open as we can be about the balance we are seeking to strike and how we can best do that. This is something that affects all of us. So it is important that all of us are included in and aware of that decision-making process. But for now, let me end by once again emphasising the key public health rules that are in place now. Please stay at home unless you're going out for essential purposes, such as exercising once a day or buying food and medicines. If you do go out, do not meet up with people from other households and stay two metres apart from other people and wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. These restrictions, as I've said, remain really tough and they get tougher as the days and the weeks go by. But they are essential and most importantly of all, they are making a difference. By doing the right thing and by staying at home, all of us are helping to make that difference. We're doing our bit to slow the spread of the virus, to protect the NHS and to save lives. So thank you once again to everyone for doing that. I'm now going to hand over to Dr Gregor Smith, the uh, Interim Chief Medical Officer, who will say a few words before I hand over to the Chief Nursing Officer and then, of course, move to questions from journalists. Gregor. Thank you, First Minister. I've spoken before about the need to ensure people know that NHS is open and ready to help them when they need it. And I want to emphasise this again to you all today. Figures show that attendances at a and &E are down 54% compared to the average for the equivalent weeks in the previous three years. But it's not this element, important though it is, that I want to concentrate on today. There's strong evidence that a reduction in people coming forward to seek help has led to lower numbers of urgent referrals for suspected cancer. This is seen not just in Scotland, but appears to be a pattern in other parts of the UK too. GPs are telling me that they are seeing much fewer people coming forward with these types of symptoms and signs. And the volume of referrals that are being received backs this up. In fact, there's been a 72% reduction in urgent suspected cancer referrals compared to the weekly average. Now, I don't believe for a second that either of these, either these diseases or these concerns have simply disappeared. So it leaves me worried that there are people out there who are not seeking help from their GP when they might need it. My message to you is very simple. Anyone who has persistent or new signs or symptoms that are worrying them should seek help and advice. Maybe you found a new lump or have new and unusual bleeding or you've got a persistent change in your bowel pattern. My message is don't ignore it. Seek advice in the same way you would have done before COVID-19. Your GP in particular is able to guide you about what may be required to ensure that your concerns are addressed. It's important to say that most concerns can be resolved fairly easily and quickly and won't turn out to be cancer, but we don't want to delay those that do need attention. Primary care practitioners will continue to ensure that urgent suspected cancer referrals are sent for those that meet the Scottish Referral Guidelines criteria. They are best placed to help you, but they need you to speak to them about this. Some clinical investigations and cancer treatment may be altered due to the risks that COVID-19 poses but it remains important that patients bring their symptoms to their GP so that they can be managed appropriately. If it was urgent before COVID-19, it remains urgent now. So my message is clear. Please don't delay unnecessarily. Your NHS remains here for you. Please seek help and attention when you need it. Thank you. Uh, and I'll hand over now to Fiona McQueen, Chief Nursing Officer. Thank you, First Minister. And emphasising what Gregor has, has said, our NHS is there, not just for COVID-19 patients, but for all of the other uh, care and attention that the people of Scotland need. We've had an amazing response, and we've talked about it before, from those who've volunteered to return to the NHS. And we're beginning to have these people um, and put in, in post to take up work, whether it's been strengthening our NHS within the intensive care units to, to care for our COVID patients, paramedics coming back, uh, physiotherapists, all swivelling around, giving our attention to making sure our health service is sustainable and continues to be strong. 
And these returners are, are doing an amazing job. We will continue to deploy our returners as we continue to work within our NHS as, as we, we move forwards, whether it is in response to COVID or our other services that we're still open for. We still want to encourage people to come and, and use them. We've also had an amazing response within our hospitals of volunteers who are, in, who are helping families to, to stay in touch um, because they're from visiting, so they can stay in touch through supporting them to do uh, FaceTime, speaking to their loved ones, running errands for them, so that people stay in hospital, whether it's with COVID or, or with other conditions, uh, can be as supported and as, as best as, as possible. So our health service is there, it's open for business, and I want to say a piece about the, the public health element of it. This week is World Health Organisation uh, Week for Immunisation, and it's drawing attention to the fact that routine vaccination is a real foundation for a strong, resilient health system. And what we want to do is encourage uh, parents of, of young children to continue to access these immunisation services. You can speak to your family nurse, your health visitor, the, the practice nurse to, to gain advice about when the right time for vaccination um, takes place. And often you'll have a phone call from the vaccination team checking that there are no symptoms, that it's safe for your child to be vaccinated, sometimes being invited into the surgery, and then other times the, the team would come to the house. And it's incredibly important. We've seen real strides in, in improving health and reducing illness um, across our, our, our young people. And that investment in the, the, our, our young mothers and our children is hugely important. So by vaccinating our pregnant women, um, again, whooping cough, and then tidying over our children and the babies with the resistance to, to pertussis until they have their actual vaccination, has seen a real reduction in, in cases of whooping cough in, in young children. Similarly with meningitis, and also rotavirus, which um, has been a real cause of distress in terms of gastrointestinal disease with, with, with young children, hospital admission, as well as, well as quite se severe illness. So our vaccination programmes are safe. They give us a real foundation for a fit and healthy childhood, and we would encourage parents to continue to use that, speak to their healthcare practitioner, and support their children to be vaccinated and immunised. Thank you, Fiona. Right, we'll go straight to questions. We've got a particularly long list of questions today. We will get through all of them, but I would make my usual plea for brevity and uh, avoiding duplication, and we will try to uh, practice what we preach on brevity as well. So first up, Lisa Summers from the BBC. Minister, we see that the Louisa Jordan Hospital is now operational, but the current position is that it is hopefully not going to be required. Is there a danger that you might look back and say that that £43 million could have been spent in a different way? There's been obviously a lot of talk about uh, testing. Uh, we know that we don't yet know what level of surveillance in the community is going on in terms of testing. We know that labs are not running at full capacity. So could you and should the Scottish Government be spending more to make sure that more testing is done and that will be a longer term sort of way out of this? Well, can I say firstly about testing? We are building up testing, including surveillance testing, and we will have more information, not just on the quantity of that that is being done, but also what that is telling us um, about the spread of the virus uh, in fairly uh, short order. Uh, the challenges we face around building up testing are about capacity, it's about supplies of the equipment you need. It's not a lack of, of money or a, an unwillingness to, to invest that money. So I think it's really important to be clear about that. On the, the question about the Louisa Jordan, uh, we said from the outset that we hope we don't have to use it for obvious reasons. And I would say that again, I fervently hope we never have to treat any patients in Louisa Jordan, because if we do that, we'll say you know, things that I would rather we weren't facing about the spread of the virus. Um, and who knows, in, in the fullness of time, there may well be people, uh, journalists, others, uh, who look back and say, why did you do that if you didn't need it? But let me be absolutely candid. I would rather be in the position of looking back and saying we uh, invested money in something that we might have needed and didn't need because of other things we did than be in a position of finding that we needed a facility like that and we decided not uh, to, to invest the, the money in it. So we are taking these decisions to make sure we have the capacity in our health service that we might need uh, looking at all of the, the scenarios and options. But all of our strategy has been trying to contain this virus so that that capacity in our health service uh, isn't overwhelmed and overrun. So I am perfectly comfortable, uh, more than comfortable, I think it would have been uh, wrong not to take the decisions we 
we've taken around the NHS Louisa Jordan, uh, albeit that I still hope we never have to use it. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. If you had begun testing earlier and made it more widespread, would we be closer to the end of the lockdown and would fewer people have died? Um, I, I don't think it is possible to, to answer questions like that at, at this stage. Um, we have at all stages done what we consider to be the right and the best uh, way of, of containing and then delaying and suppressing the spread of this virus, informed by science, informed by evidence, and of course, informed by our best judgment. As we uh, go th get through this pandemic and as we are coming out of the other side of this pandemic, which is not imminently, uh, everybody will want to look back and learn lessons. That's important for accountability. It's important for planning for the future. But I think it is uh, premature and not possible right now to, to look at different approaches and say X worked and, and Y didn't work. We are not always comparing like with like. We are not through this pandemic yet. We see in some places uh, that lock down earlier and have started to lift lockdown measures that cases are resurging. Um, again, we are seeing, you know, sort of uh, adaptation and revising of some of the numbers of deaths in places like, like Wuhan. Uh, and there's still a, an element about this virus that we don't fully understand. So my job as First Minister is to get the best advice I can get, apply the better judgment to that and continue on a path that is very clearly about suppressing this virus, making sure we don't overwhelm our National Health Service and saving lives. And over the next few weeks, trying to see if we can do all of that uh, in a way that allows us also to restore some normality to everyday life. None of this is easy, but these are the challenges we have to seek to address. Uh, Peter Smith from ITV News. Um, yeah, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, I noticed that Denmark has announced that companies which pay out dividends buy back um, their own shares or are registered in tax havens will not be eligible for any bailout. I'm wondering, is that something that you would consider uh, pushing for here? Um, I, I think two, two things. Firstly, I think companies uh, that don't uh, operate in a, a fair uh, way uh, should not be uh, necessarily easily able to access uh, public funds. So in principle, um, obviously, I, I don't know all of the detail of, of what uh, has been done in Denmark, but in principle, yes, I, I do think those kind of principles uh, have to apply here. We want support uh, to be available for businesses, uh, but we want that, obviously, as we would with any form of public support, to go to those most in need. So we've said, you know, if businesses feel that they don't need to access some of the grants we're making available or some of the wider support that's coming through the UK government, Government, then, then don't apply for it because we want as much of this as possible to go to the businesses that most need it. And of course, we always want businesses to operate fair uh, work practices and also play fair in terms of paying their taxes and contributing to society. And, you know, if anything, uh, this uh, experience right now is showing us the importance of that, the importance of that collegiate uh, nature of society where we all do the right things and support each other uh, when we need it. Ross Govins from STV. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, the funeral of a former Inverness firefighter is taking place today following his death from COVID-19. Like all funerals at the moment, there will just be a handful of mourners there. When will plans be considered to relax restrictions on the numbers that can attend? I mean, this is one of the, the aspects of the restrictions that I think are are toughest for people who are suffering bereavement. And I, I don't think it is possible to underestimate just how uh, difficult that is and, and how much that adds to the grief that people are feeling. So I, I don't in any way want to be insensitive in how I answer this question because I'm extremely sensitive uh, to this. But it is one of these things that we have to consider as part of our overall strategy. And therefore, it is premature right now for me to stand here and say, give a date on which these particular restrictions might be relaxed or the extent to which we might relax them. We must make sure that all of these decisions are being guided uh, by the best evidence we've got about how we can continue to suppress this virus while trying to get as much normality uh, as possible. And these will be the difficult decisions we are contemplating in the next few weeks and trying to come to uh, final positions on. Uh, so I, I can't give any more uh, 
definite answer on that right now, except to say that for all those who have not just lost a loved one to COVID-19 right now, but for anybody who's going through the grieving process, I, I absolutely understand how much more difficult it is made by not being able to say goodbye to your loved ones in the way that we normally do. So this is very much uh, in the upper uh, most uh, regions of our mind as we think about all of these things. Peter McMahon, ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, uh, ITB Board has been speaking to dairy farmers in the southwest of Scotland, an extremely important industry, as you know. Now, they are saying they're warning the National Farmers Union of Scotland are warning that uh, farmers, uh, they think some of them won't make it through this crisis due to the drop in demands. They're pouring milk down the drain. So what extra help, and I would stress that they think they need extra help, can you give them to help their industry get through this crisis? Well, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, right now in response to that question, uh, say exactly what help we will or, or can give. What I will do is give an assurance that we will continue, as we have been doing, to talk to, uh, whether it's the National Farming Union, uh, particular sectors, and work out how best we can provide support. I, I know it's a different example, but you, uh, we've talked about it before. We've done that already for the seafood sector. For example, so I know Fergus Ewing is very closely in touch uh, with all parts of the rural economy. But as a, a result of your question, and as soon as I'm out of this briefing, I will ask him to particularly talk to the NFU and the dairy sector in particular to look at what more we can do to try to help them through what is an incredibly challenging time for them and for uh, others in, in different sectors of our economy as well. Uh, Kieran Jenkins, Channel 4. First Minister... How many gowns are being used across the NHS in Scotland per day just now? How many will be required if you reach peak capacity and need to use these extra beds at the NHS, Louise Jordan and elsewhere? And how many gowns do you currently have in the stockpile in reserve? OK, I'm not going to give you the specific figures. I will provide those figures for you. I, I'm sure everybody at home appreciates I, I'm not going to come in here every day trying to impart proper information, trying to memorise all of these precise figures. We have all of these figures. They are monitored daily and we'll provide them to you uh, in detail. We have right now uh, adequate stocks of all of the main uh, items of PPE equipment, but we are not complacent about that. Gowns is one of the items that is under most pressure, uh, not just because of the demand from our own health and care workers, but because of the global constraints on that supply. So these are issues that are uh, monitored on a, a several times a day basis. NSS, National Services Scotland, our procurement agency, is working literally round the clock, making sure that we are replenishing supplies as they are used. You will have seen at the weekend the uh, plane that came in to Presswick uh, with not gowns, but with uh, a large quantity of masks and, and other uh, supplies that we need for our National Health Service. So the, the, the levels of stock, the demand usage, uh, our predictions of how much stock we have got and what we are doing in terms of orders and discussions with other countries across the UK to replenish that are issues that have our ongoing attention uh, each and every single day. Do you want to add anything, Fiona? First Minister, we have we have sufficient gowns. Of course, are not used extensively. They're used within an intensive care unit and other bespoke units. They're very very important to keep our staff safe. But at the moment, we do have a sufficient supply. And as the First Minister said, continuing to make sure that that supply will, will be progressed. Of course, if Louisa Jordan opens, then that means that we'll have had more cases. And it may or may not mean that gowns will be needed there, because, of course, gowns are not needed everywhere, as I said, principally in intensive care units, where there, there are particular specialist procedures. So at the moment, we have enough. We have our supplies coming in, and we do regularly monitor precisely what we have, because we know that sometimes staff are thoughtful and anxious about it. But... Um, managers on the ground are being very, very um, particular about making sure that there's the right stock there for staff to keep them safe. I can't emphasise enough how important this is to us, um, to make sure that those on the front line have what they need. And we will provide the, 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 the detailed figures. But again, a word of caution, these figures, if obviously it stands to reason, it's a pretty obvious point, but these figures are always changing as we use stocks, replenish stocks. So, uh, 
the figures are important, but actually what is more important are the processes and procedures uh, and procurement uh, routes that we have to make sure on an ongoing basis that we continue to have the supplies we need and crucially to get those supplies to the front line where, where they are needed, which is why we've done so much work uh, both for the health service and more recently for social care to make those distribution routes as uh, quick, effective and efficient as possible. And my last point is the reminder that we have that email address for anybody on the front line who feels they haven't got what they need to uh, contact us directly so that we can take steps to address that. Uh, Jack Foster from Global Radio. First Minister, uh, there was a target of 700 ICU beds set some time ago now. I was wondering if you were able to update us on where we are with that. Um, perhaps you might not know the exact figure, um, but where are we on, on Scotland's ICU bed capacity at the moment, not including the NHS Louisa Jordan temporary hospital, uh, given that the hope is that that will never be used. But also, and perhaps more importantly, do we have the same number of ventilators as we do beds and staff to use them? And if, as is probably the case, we don't have an optimal number of staff, what is the ratio of trained staff to number of beds currently? So I, if, if I don't give you all of the detail you're, you're wanting, then I'll come back to that later on. But right now, our surge capacity, so the number of beds that we can uh, bring into operation in terms of equipped and staffed beds is 585. Uh, we are in the process of taking that to, to 700, which involves equipment uh, coming on stream and staff being trained. But the surge capacity right now is 585. That doesn't include the NHS Louisa Jordan, because as you say, that's capacity we, we hope that we don't have to use. Uh, in terms, of, I gave you the figure earlier on for uh, the number of patients that are in intensive care right now with confirmed or suspected COVID, uh, that is 169. In total, including patients who are in intensive care for other reasons, we have uh, 248 uh, patients in ICU as at nine o'clock this morning. Um, so we have, and again, none of what I say here about whether it's PPE or ICU is intended to convey any complacency at all. This is uh, another issue that we monitor on a, an ongoing uh, daily basis, but uh, the surge capacity uh, minus those who are in ICU gives us over 300 uh, ICU uh, beds that are uh, not being used at the moment and therefore potentially available. Um, again, don't read any complacency into this because I've said repeatedly that it's still too early to draw firm conclusions, but we are now, we think, seeing in the figures that have been reported over a number of days now uh, show this, we are starting to see a, a downward uh, trajectory of ICU COVID uh, patients. Of course, we can't yet be certain that that will continue in that uh, direction. It is likely to continue to fluctuate, but uh, the position on ICU is one that we continue to keep under uh, close review for, for obvious reasons. Uh, Chris McLaughlin from uh, BBC Radio Scotland. Thank you, First Minister. Um, sport plays a huge part in Scottish life and for some it's big business. Um, with that in mind, um, and given the information you have available today, would you agree with some leading epidemiologists who say that it's very unlikely the stadiums can be filled again before a vaccine is found? And how feasible is playing large sporting events behind closed doors? Um, Look, again, this comes back to what I've said before. I'm not yet in a position to give you dates on when things will start again and in what order that we might see things start to go back to normal. Um, but I would absolutely say that people should not uh, be under uh, the expectation that large scale mass gatherings will be starting any time soon. Uh, because you know we must make sure that we are doing everything we can to continue to suppress this virus and as we start to lift restrictions, uh, A, make sure we've got the capability in place through test, trace, isolate to replace those restrictions, but also to continue to have the understanding that some form of social distancing is going to be required perhaps up to the point where a vaccine is available. So, you know, that's me being as frank and honest as possible. We want to get a semblance of normality back into people's lives uh, for all sorts of reasons as quickly as possible, but we cannot do that in a way that risks a resurgence of this virus and then all of the things that we've been trying to avoid becoming uh, what happens uh, again. So I, I know that is 
Uh, not good news for people, which is the majority of our population who feel uh, and have sport as a really important part of their lives and, and our culture and, and how we use our leisure time. Uh, but it would be wrong for me to give uh, false uh, expectation right now about an early resumption of football matches or rugby matches or large scale sporting events like that. In terms of playing behind closed doors, you know, clearly there are issues there. Uh, in terms of uh, does that completely take away the risk of, of big events? If, if, some, if a, a match has been played behind closed doors but it's still on television, the danger then is people will still congregate together in groups to watch that. So these things all have to be very carefully considered. And what I will say is that they will be very carefully considered and we will share as much of that consideration uh, with you as we can. Do you want to add anything on mass gathering? No, I think I just wanted yeah. to emphasise that point about just the, the very act of playing behind closed doors doesn't mean to say that you won't get gatherings of people to try to enjoy sport together. And that all it does sometimes is it displaces other people to other environments to watch that sport together. So we need to be very careful. And again, you know, we need to be led by where the science and the evidence is for the future as we begin to learn how to live with this virus. Uh, Tom Magner from Carers World Radio. Well, good afternoon, First Minister, and thank you. This is a question on the subject of people's well-being. How will you ensure that the Distress Brief Intervention Mental Health Support Scheme proactively reaches unpaid carers isolated at home? Thank you. That's a very important question. Last week, of course, we set out uh, funding to expand uh, the provision of distress brief interventions. That's a, a service available for people who need uh, some support for uh, their mental health. And we live in a time right now where face-to-face -face services like that are not possible in the way that they uh, have been previously. So much of this is uh, online or, or by telephone. In terms of people, uh, unpaid carers, for example, who are at home, Anybody who presents to frontline services, whether that's the police, the ambulance service, the NHS, where it is considered necessary uh, or where it is considered that they would benefit from uh, being referred on to a DBI, uh, then that will happen. So this is a service that is uh, there for people, whatever their circumstances, if they present in a way that says it would be appropriate or helpful for them. Uh, can I go now to Katrine Bussey from the Press Association? Good afternoon, First Minister. A um, couple of questions following on from yesterday's Sunday Times article regarding the Prime Minister and COBRA. I wanted to ask your reaction to uh, the emergence of the fact that the Prime Minister chose not to go to several of the COBRA meetings about the COVID-19 virus earlier on this year. And also, I wanted to ask if you had attended all the COBRA meetings about COVID-19 that you have been invited to dial into? Uh, the Scottish Government has attended uh, all of the COBRA meetings that we've been invited uh, to dial into. That uh, has on occasion uh, been uh, through the Health Secretary. Um, if I think back to 10 years or more ago when I was Health Secretary during the swine flu pandemic, it was I that uh, tended to take uh, part in these uh, COBRA meetings at the time. They were chaired at the time by uh, the UK uh, Health Secretary. I have been chairing um, Scottish Government resilience meetings since um, I think the 28th or the 29th of January was the first one uh, that, that I chaired. Uh, we've been meeting regularly for those uh, who don't by now know that the uh, Scottish Government resilience room score, as we call it, is our equivalent of COBRA. I've, uh, I think, missed one of those when I was visiting uh, the south of Scotland uh, after areas down there had been flooded and it was uh, chaired in my absence by the Deputy First Minister. So, you know, these are important uh, planning arrangements to make sure not just the Scottish Government, but all of our partners uh, are doing all the things uh, that we require to do. In terms of the Prime Minister's attendance, look, I, I think it's probably for the UK Government to address that. I'm very focused right now in trying to uh, concentrate on the decisions I have to take and the discussions I have to have with others in order to inform uh, these decisions. That has my 100% uh, focus right now. And in the fullness of time, I guess we will all be able to look back and, and give views on what happened and what didn't happen. But right now, I've got a massive job of work to do, as anybody in a leadership position has, and, and that is what I will focus on, on doing. What is really important, at, whether it's COBRA or the Scottish Government resilience meetings, is what we decide there and what plans are put in place and how we take the decisions that navigate us through. And, and that's been important throughout this pandemic, but it 
gets all the more important uh, even as we go forward in terms of taking the right decisions to continue to suppress the virus but allow us to bring as much normality back to life as possible. And those decisions are not going to be easy. They're going to be very challenging, which is why they need to have my uh, absolute focus and the absolute focus of those who work with me. Uh, Seth Carell from The Guardian. Sorry. Hello, First Minister. Sorry. Just to go back to the question of testing. Um, over the last 14 days, the uh, Scottish NHS has tested an average of 1,100 people a day. I'm just wondering, firstly, what actually is now the capacity for testing for the coronavirus? And secondly, why isn't it being used to its fullest extent? Right now, it's around 2,000. It will be uh, at least 3,500 by the end of this month, which is what we have said. And actually, I've got a reasonable degree of confidence right now that the capacity by the end of April will be in excess of that 3,500. Uh, that doesn't include uh, certain things like the drive-through test centres, which are uh, over and above that. The capacity I'm talking about is the capacity from National Health Service labs in Scotland. In terms of using that capacity, so we have that growing capacity, uh, there is still work that is being done and needs to be done to make sure we are using that capacity to the maximum. Uh, that has focused uh, not exclusively but largely on making sure we are testing NHS and care workers and their families where that is appropriate. Uh, there's more than 12,000, and that figure will be higher now, but the most recent report shows more than 12,000 NHS care workers and their families being tested. Uh, we are trying to get many more care workers uh, through testing, given the uh, severity and urgency of the issues in, in the care sector. Surveillance testing, particularly as we go through this next phase to inform the decisions we're taking, will be a key part of that. We will be uh, setting out hopefully later this week, but certainly over the next uh, number of days, more detail on exactly what testing we are doing, in what categories, and how that matches with our capacity. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you, First Minister. Um, on the issue of financial support, um, the Money Advice Trust south of the border is asking for um, council tax increases to be stalled. Now, on the 19th of March, John Swinney was asked about this issue and said all options were being considered. Um, I just wondered, um, given these increases have already come in up here, is any work still being done on this or has it been ruled out now? Look, look, nothing is ruled out as we continue to navigate our way through the virus and also deal as effectively as we can with the impact of the lockdown measures. Uh, local authorities have always been able uh, to consider, uh, it's local authorities who decide within the parameters we set, whether and to what extent to increase the council tax. So they have always had the ability to decide not to do that. Uh, what the Scottish Government has done is give additional money to local authorities to allow for the extension of the council tax reduction scheme so that more people, uh, perhaps, who require to apply for uh, rebates on their council tax can get that. And uh, if um, memory serves me correctly, I'll correct this later if it's wrong, I think about £40 million uh, was provided by the Scottish Government a, a number of weeks ago to local authorities for that support for the council tax reduction scheme. So we continue to consider all options to make sure we are getting help to where it is needed most. We're going to be uh, in uh, the... the realms of dealing with this crisis for quite a considerable uh, time to come now and therefore it would be wrong for any of us to rule things out we must be open-minded and flexible in how our response develops in the, the weeks and probably months to come. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. First Minister, um, Sunday the Health Secretary said that you would publish care inspectorate information about the number of virus cases in care homes uh, later that same week, which didn't happen. Uh, yesterday, we also asked for the number of people tested under your com community surveillance scheme. Um, and the health secretary said that we would get the figures later in the day, uh, which again, didn't happen. I just wondered what the public should conclude from this and, and when it's likely that we will get the information. Um, what the public should conclude from it is that we're working hard to make sure that the information we publish is robust and reliable. Some of this information is, is information that we've not gathered before, so we've got to make sure the systems of gathering it and the quality of the information we get 
is accurate so that when we put information out there, the public can have confidence in it. So that's why I think the public should take for the fact that we sometimes have to take a bit of time to get this uh, absolutely right. In Scotland, uh, I, I will stand to be corrected if, if I'm, I'm wrong about this, but I think we are publishing already more and certainly more up-to-date information than any other part of the UK. In terms of the information from the care inspectorate, we, we already publish cumulative uh, figures for the number of care homes who have had cases of COVID-19. What we are moving to do, and uh, this should be published on Wednesday this week, is uh, being able to publish uh, the number of care homes who have an active outbreak, because the figure we published just now will include care homes who've had cases but who don't currently have cases because uh, the, the outbreak is over. So that figure of live uh, cases we hope to publish from Wednesday. But again, it's really important that we get it right and robust. Similarly, with surveillance testing, we are uh, increasing the amount of surveillance testing we do right now. I should say testing is only one part of our surveillance. We also look carefully at the, the figures we uh, report on every day for hospitalizations and ICU case numbers, the, the numbers of people sadly dying. There's other uh, ways in which uh, Health Protection Scotland and our experts uh, can uh, have of uh, making sure that they're tracking uh, this virus. So again, later this week, we will be able to provide more detailed information, not just of quantities, uh, which I know is important, uh, but over the next couple of weeks, and this dovetails very closely with the work I've talked about, about thinking through the next phase of this, what that surveillance is telling us about how the virus is spreading, or hopefully uh, what it is telling us about the slowing down of that spread of the virus. So I know there is, and I share it, I, uh, there's probably not a day goes by when I'm not asking my team in here for more data, more information. There is a, a huge understandable and legitimate appetite for this, which we are seeking uh, to make sure is uh, delivered upon. But I hope everybody understands that in a very difficult, challenging, rapidly evolving situation, we need to make sure that the data we are publishing is robust and reliable. Um, so there's been things we have committed to previously, like the number of deaths in care homes, for example, that information has now been published. So we want to publish as much as possible, but we must make sure it's accurate. And that's why sometimes, and it can frustrate me as much as others, it takes just a bit longer to get to the position where we can confidently do that. Uh, but we will uh, do it. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, another day, another massive care home death toll. We hear 15 residents have died in Crosslet's care home in Dumbarton, um, this time a local authority state-of-the-art care home, which has only been open two years. But despite the deaths, we're told no residents have been tested. The testing of staff last week, however, found five positive cases. Is it not time to suspend all new residents coming into this home until there is more control over the outbreak? And was the increased PPE guidance too little too late? Um, I'm going to head over to uh, Gregor Smith in a moment to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the process of and the risk assessments associated with uh, residents being admitted to care homes, or in some cases, residents being readmitted to care homes, which, remember, is their own home after a period in hospital. Uh, but let me say, firstly, I, I'm not going to comment uh, before I have all of the information on individual uh, care homes, uh, but we are working hard. We've, we've given a leadership role in uh, making sure that care homes are managing this situation properly to public health directors who will work through local health protection teams, uh, local authorities and the care inspectorate to make sure the right action is being taken. Uh, we have uh, taken a decision and guidance has already been published around this to move to a situation of testing all symptomatic residents in care homes um, and that is in the process of being implemented. Although, as we said last week, that is not about changing the clinical management of outbreaks or cases, which brings me to my last point, that we have guidance in place for all care homes that residents, and this is very difficult, residents should be isolated already. And certainly any uh, resident being admitted from hospital to a care home, uh, because sometimes that will be in the best interest of a, a resident for them not to be in hospital any longer than they need to be. But all of that guidance around isolation and infection prevention and control uh, must be followed. And that's for public health directors, health protection teams and the care inspector to ensure is happening. Gregor, do you want to say a bit more about that? So, so I think it's, um, 
it's very clear to me that the, right from even before the first cases started to become apparent in care homes, there has been guidance which has been available. And the relationship between local care homes and local health protection teams is, is absolutely critical in making sure that this guidance is applied um, exactly as, as it was intended. And part of that is to have a, a, a discussion whenever a case becomes apparent. And um, we've recommended testing for those first cases right from... Uh, before the first cases were apparent, um, but, but, but to make sure that those discussions take place to uh, decide on a proper basis whether um, any further admissions to those care homes should take place or not, and that that risk assessment process is part of the absolutely critical way where we can start to kind of um, safeguard care homes. Um, we've said also from the beginning that it's really important that um, uh, residents of care homes um, are isolated, that effective infection prevention and control um, regimes are in place within care homes. All these um, approaches taken together are designed to try to maximise the safety of these care homes and particularly uh, run about those transitions of care, whether people come from hospitals or from the community. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, just for the uh, Chief Medical Officer, I just wondered if you could provide the raw data behind the figures that you cited earlier with the 54% and 72% drops in A&E and cancer referrals, and whether you had um, comparative figures for stroke and heart attacks. Um, and for the First Minister, um, I'm sure parents everywhere will welcome the guidance issue today, but shouldn't you be looking at curtailing the two-month summer holiday to help pupils catch up on the, the weeks and weeks of schooling that they've missed? I like Gregor. If this information is not to hand right now, so we can try to provide it later. But Gregor, do you want to address yeah, so that? I've got some of the data that you spoke about here. So if we look at the um, urgent suspected cancer referrals, um, if you like, uh, on, a, on an average week, um, we, we would normally expect to, to receive in the region of 2,700 of uh, those referrals. Um, this week, um, or, or last week, we received 744 and, and when we look at that um, figure, even compared to the week before, it's, it's reduced again. The, the week before that was 948. So you'll see that over time there has been really quite a worrying reduction in the number of referrals which have come into the system um, for people who require further investigation because there's an urgent suspicion of cancer. Now, when I speak to GPs on the ground, what they're telling me is, is that, that people are just not approaching practices just now with these type of symptoms. They are not generating the referrals because people are approaching them um, with, with, with these concerns. My message very, very clearly to people is, please do not sit in these symptoms. If it was urgent before COVID-19 came along, it's urgent now. Go and speak to your GP teams, go and speak to your primary care practitioners, speak to them about the symptoms you've got. The majority of these will turn out to be something which can be very easily dealt with and, and won't be cancer. But in amongst that, there will be some people who have symptoms which unfortunately lead to a diagnosis of cancer and we can't delay those diagnoses. Please go and speak to someone about it. Um, and briefly for me on uh, the second question, look, these are all issues we will uh, take into account in our consideration going forward. We can't uh, say that we are going to reopen schools before we have a degree of confidence that that would not lead to a resurgence of the virus. And we're not yet in a position to give certainty about when that might be. But we are acutely aware, and I am acutely aware, it's one of the many impacts of the lockdown measures of the uh, knock-on effect on the education and broader well-being of young people. So we will, as we move forward and take these decisions about potentially reopening schools over, over the future period, how we then also mitigate um, and, and reduce the impact on children's learning. I, I come back to the point, none of these judgments are straightforward right now, but all of these different uh, factors have to be taken into account because while the lockdown, including closure of schools, is essential now to suppress the virus, everybody knows and the government is so aware of the fact that the lockdown in itself has consequences and these are all uh, aspects that we need to manage in as careful and considered a way as possible which is what we will do. Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Good afternoon First Minister. Um, in terms of exiting the lockdown I wonder if you're able to tell us have you drawn up specific blueprints for the preferred options on how to do this or, 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 or just how much and I know you just how much detail have you got on that in terms of your planning and I was also wondering there's been suggestions that antibody tests 
who could play a key role in this. Are we any closer to how, what's the state of play reprogress towards antibody testing? OK, I'll, I'll hand over uh, to Gregor on the antibody test point in a moment. Just um, in, in relation to the first part of your question, in short, no, I don't want people to expect or have a, an expectation that later this week we will set out a blueprint that says X measure is going to be lifted on Y date and that there will be an order like that. Not because I, I don't desperately want to be in a position of being able to set out that detail, but because we are not yet in a position with enough evidence about where we are with the virus to do that safely. Uh, so what we will do later this week is set out what it is we're trying to achieve, what the factors are that we need to take account of, particularly this uh, absolute necessity to keep what's called the R number of this virus uh, below one, what we, the, the different options uh, in very broad terms might look like and how we go about assessing those and what the framework of, of that decision will be. Uh, what we set out this week, I would be very clear, I want to be very clear, is very much the first iteration of what will be a living document. And it's all about trying, as I said on uh, Friday, uh, I think it was that, you know, you all watching this are grown ups, uh, so you can be trusted with uh, the information that is guiding us. And we will discuss this in a very open and inclusive way uh, to uh, evidence how difficult these decisions are, but how important it is that we get it right. But this week will be an early uh, iteration of that, that we will build on as the the evidence, the data and the modelling allows us to do so. Um, we do hope antibody testing will still be a part of that if we can get reliable tests and obviously more uh, data and uh, information on just what degree of immunity uh, this virus confers. But I'm probably uh, wise to hand over to Gregor on this issue. So, so the whole issue of antibody testing has been incredibly challenging for, for, for COVID-19. And part of the reason for that is because we're still beginning to fully understand what the body's antibody response is to this virus. Um, as we've said all along, this is a new virus. We're constantly learning about it. We, we, we know that um, particularly for those people with mild disease, sometimes it's a very delayed antibody response that people get, and that becomes very difficult to detect it in the blood. So with the current testing um, uh, approaches that, that have been deployed, um, it's becoming apparent that not all those responses may be becoming detected. So as I say, we, 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 we're learning all the time as, as to how that um, antibody reaction in the blood um, not only appears but persists over a length of time as well. However, what I would say is that I think there have been some encouraging signs of progress with antibody testing, particularly over the last week or so, and uh, we continue to keep a very close eye on the developments in this area just to see exactly when we're likely to have a test which is reliable enough to detect not only those who've had kind of moderate or severe disease and therefore quite a marked antibody response, but the 80% of people who actually have very mild disease and, and actually may have a very delayed antibody response. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, it's just in uh, relation to yesterday's revelations in the Sunday Times, uh, what faith do you have, if any, in the UK government and that uh, is, is, is proceeding in the, in the correct way in dealing with the coronavirus outbreak? Look, we're all trying to do the best things based on the best information and advice we've got, applying our best judgment. I, I've said at the outset, and I'm going to stick to this, I'm going to avoid getting into political considerations there will be i hope plenty of time in future for us to look back all of us and learn lessons we will all have and will continue to make mistakes in this that is in the nature of dealing with something none of us have ever dealt with before but you know i know how hard the scottish government is working i know how uh, hard I'm working to try to make sure that we take the best decisions uh, at the right time based on the best evidence and you know i I have no reason to believe that is not what everybody in a similar position to me is, is seeking to do. And we've got to work together as well as we can on that, while, of course, all of us uh, doing what we judge to be right for the, the populations we serve. And that's the, the principle of uh, operation that I'm going to stick to on this. The only thing that matters to me right now is doing the best I can with the teams that work with me to make sure that we are suppressing this virus, protecting our health service and saving lives. That is is all that anybody, any of us, should be focused on doing right now. Uh, Chris McCall from The Scotsman. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. I'd like to return to the issue of homeschooling 
in light of the guidance published today. Um, you may have seen that yesterday the Department of Education in England and Wales is now planning to loan laptops or tablets to disadvantaged uh, teenagers who may lack access to computers. I was wondering if you could tell me if the Scottish Government is planning to follow suit or if you could give me any more information on the, the plans that are in place to support um, teenagers and young people who are from disadvantaged backgrounds and may lack the access to educational tools to kind of teach themselves from home. We want to support any uh, efforts that can reasonably help reduce that gap. And I said in my opening remarks, one of the things we've done um, is give local authorities flexibility about how they use the Scottish Attainment Challenge funding uh, to make sure that they are helping uh, children and families uh, from more disadvantaged backgrounds during a time when they're not in school and, and learning at home. So we will continue to look at all options for doing that, uh, working with uh, local authorities as necessary. And you know, as with so much of what we're doing right now, uh, dealing with the impact of this and dealing with the impact in a way that doesn't deepen existing inequalities is a really important priority for us. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. I'd like to just go back to the cancer referrals that were raised, the drop in cancer, cancer referrals. The Scottish Government previously suspended cancer screening programmes in Scotland. Are you concerned that this has impacted the number of people coming forward to GPs or their doctors regarding symptoms that they're shown of cancer? And also, could a decline in the number of people using a a &E and other health services be responsible for a rise in deaths not linked to coronavirus in Scotland? I'll hand over to Greg in a second. Can I just very briefly uh, take people back to uh, the, the, the reasoning we set out when that decision about pausing the screening programmes was taken, that there was a very careful uh, consideration given to the balance of risk. Um, and both because of uh, the risks to people of going for screening, but also uh, the fact that pausing the screening programme would actually allow us then to get people back into screening with uh, reduced delay uh, compared to if we simply allowed uh, the programmes to continue, people missed their appointments and then it might be three years before they were back uh, into that cycle. So this is not, was not an easy decision, was not one taken lightly, uh, but the consideration around that balance of risk was what uh, drove that. But on the broader questions, I'll hand over to Gregor. So I think it's really important that we don't confuse what are two very separate pathways of care for very different purposes. And uh, the figures that I've spoken about today, about the urgent suspected cancer referrals, are people who would normally come to see their GP with symptoms which um, would classify them as, as, as having a, a, a kind of um, suspicion that, that an underlying diagnosis might include, but not be just related to, but might include cancer. So this is a very, very different pathway. And what we've seen is a real reduction in people who are coming forward to speak to the GP about these type of symptoms so that they're not being captured and not being referred on for further investigation. That's wholly separate from screening, which is a completely different process. So as I say, I think it's just really important that we, we were very, very clear that, that, that these are two very different pathways. Having said that, I would emphasise again, if people are presenting with symptoms which would normally cause them concern, and I've outlined some of the symptoms that sometimes people might have concern about, whether they felt a new lump, whether they've experienced new or unusual bleeding, whether they've had a persistent change in their bowel habit. These are symptoms that GPs really want to see you about, that they expect you to come and speak to you about. Now, I recognise there's a different way of accessing your GP as well, but that doesn't stop you from making contact with them, just to make sure that you've had a chance to speak these over and make sure that your GP has an opportunity to give you guidance about what needs to happen next. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hi there. Um, I want to return to that point you made earlier. Um, you're saying you're doing the best um, with the information that you have. I'm going to read you a quote from Harry Burns this morning. He said, the problem lies south of the border, and as much as the stuff we saw in the Sunday Times yesterday would suggest a really very lackadaisical approach was taken by the UK government. He went on, his, his advice to you was, don't rely on what's coming from south of the border because I think the political situation down there has been at times very unhelpful. Just get out there and get testing. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I asked if you were getting all the information you needed from COBRA following earlier reports in the Sunday Times. 
that decision making was being taken by the cabinet, but not at Cobra, to stop you quotes forcing the issue. And you said Cobra was very helpful. And the following week, Matt Hancock announced a testing strategy involving 100,000 people a day, including Glasgow University was involved in that, that you hadn't seen. Builders ignored your order to down tools. Yesterday, it emerged that the UK government is working on a traffic light exit strategy that Gene Freeman said you hadn't seen. So I'll ask again, are you confident that you're getting all the information you need from, from COBRA? And, and just to address Harry's final point, um, I don't get a sense from what you said that Westminster's holding you back from testing. Could you have mobilised Scottish universities like Glasgow to ramp up testing yourself after that first dire COBRA meeting? And, and if so, why didn't you? Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, I, I have uh, not held back uh, previously in saying where I thought it was right for us to go uh, a bit further or faster, you know, mass gatherings, schools to a, a limited extent, um, and around uh, taking, I think, a, a bit of a, a tougher line on, on business closure, construction being an illustration of that, and I, I will not hesitate to do that in future. Uh, equally, um, we will continue to work to try to get the best and fullest information uh, through the COBRA uh, arrangements that we can. Um, you know, this, the stuff in the Sunday newspapers, I, uh, I, I still don't know exactly what that's based on, and so I will say openly, it's really important in all of this uh, for governments, uh, and I say governments plural, I'm including all of us, not to be driven by the kind of normal political media handling strategies that we might operate on in normal times. This is not about uh, a 24 hour news cycle. This is about taking the right decisions as far as any of us can do in the right way based on the best evidence. And that is what I will, will continue to do. Uh, one of the things we did um, at an earlier stage of, of this pandemic, of course, was establish our own scientific advisory group, which links into SAGE, but gives us an additional route now to get very Scottish tailored and Scottish specific advice. Um, that is the, the CMO advisory group that Professor Andrew Morris chairs. And I think that is an important development and one that I think stands us in good stead. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't continue to take the advice from SAGE and work through COBRA, but it gives us that level of uh, additional uh, advice and, and detail that I certainly feel as First Minister is important. O on testing, we are harnessing uh, the university uh, capability. Uh, obviously, Glasgow University has a lab that's about to get underway as part of that UK-wide uh, structure, but we are also looking to harness, uh, build up the NHS lab capacity, but harness additional academic and commercial capacity. I have got uh, a fairly strong, I hesitate I, again to say I'm never complacent about any of these things, but I've got a fairly strong degree of confidence in our uh, build up of testing capacity. It needs to go further as we go into the next phase of dealing with this virus. Uh, our focus right now is making sure that we are not just building up that capacity, but using it to the full and using it in the right strategic way. So all of these things are our responsibilities uh, and the responsibilities we're very focused on, albeit working in that bigger UK way. And indeed, looking carefully to learn from other countries across Europe and the wider world uh, right now as we try to chart the best way forward. Uh, and lastly, Alistair Grant from The Herald. Hi there, thanks very much. Um, can I just ask, will the Scot Scottish Government be releasing any data on the, the demographics of hospital and ICU patients? For example, their ethnicity, socioeconomic status or job profile, obesity rates, since some of these are starting to emerge as potential risk factors for COVID-19. Are we gathering that data? And if I could just quickly follow on from that, are we going to get details on Scotland's ICU mortality rate from coronavirus? I think this has been published for England, Wales and Northern Ireland already. Uh, but I don't think it's been published for Scotland. So, yes, we, for obvious reasons, not just to inform the public, but also to learn as much about this virus as possible, we will want to be uh, producing, uh, gathering, producing and publishing as much information uh, as possible. And we're, in a, we're on a path of, of doing that. Some of the specifics you raised there, we'll come back to you with uh, more detail about exactly when and in what uh, form that's going to be published. There is a, a UK-wide study looking at demographics, how people uh, have... Uh, done in hospital once they've been admitted, uh, which brings to bear some of the, the risk factors. Uh, and I'll ask Gregor to say a little bit more about that. 
So we've got uh, some very important research networks that are looking at exactly these type of issues. The, the COSIN network, the COVID-19 uh, clinical information network, uh, we have Scottish units who are um, within that process sharing their data so that we kind of get the learning that you're talking about, about some of the factors which may put people at additional risk for COVID-19 and, and actually how we should respond to that additional risk as well. So factors like um, ethnicity uh, are really important in all of this. Um, but, but there's lots of other things such as pre-existing conditions as well that we need to learn about. So we have Scottish units feeding that information on a regular basis into the COSIN network and so that we can share that learning on a, on, on a UK basis. Okay, um, that concludes all the questions we have today. Can I um, thank uh, Gregor and Fiona uh, for joining me here today? Can I also take the opportunity, which I've not done expressly yet, although I think it every day, to thank the signers who are signing for us at these uh, daily updates, because that I know is so important in terms of the accessibility of the information that we are uh, giving. And can I thank uh, the journalists for the questions, as always, and thank all of you for uh, watching. I hope you still find the information that we're giving here uh, useful. Uh, and we will be back at the same time, 12.30 tomorrow. Thank you very much.